Hey everyone, welcome to the day eight of the Data Cloud Bootcamp. Thank you for continuing on the journey with us. So we have completed seven sessions so far, and we are now uh, into the eighth day, and we're going to look at the insights uh, section of the Data Cloud. These are the sections that we have taken from the exam guide of the certification. So we're following that order. And the next sessions we have identity resolution, the next uh, Tuesday, and then we have activations. And the following week, we have the data ac actions and the ask me anything panel. And this is a gentle reminder for everyone to fill out the form with your questions. So the sooner you fill out the form, uh, the greater chances that your questions will be answered during the panel. And Matt, Arvind, and hopefully Vlad will be joining us for the panel. And I'll be sharing the form link shortly in the chat window. Make sure you fill out all your questions in there. And after the bootcamp, so the bootcamp is ending on 22nd of February, and we have TDX in between. And after TDX, we have the deep dive sessions kicking off. So there'll be a few more sessions added and the dates also will be finalized on these sessions. And the, these are the dates up the, that we are starting with. On third, uh, uh, March 12th, we are getting started and we follow the same schedule. Every Tuesday and Thursday, 9 p.m., we will meet again to discuss uh, about the use cases of the uh, data cloud and also we dive deeper into the demo section as well. We have all the experts lined up and some other sessions are in the plans also. And after the deep dive sessions, we have this build with us workshop sessions. Um, so we have identified these important uh, topics that uh, need some hands-on experience. So we will be coming up with the schedule as well. This will be sometime in June. So we are actively working on creating the uh, workbook and all these necessary resources for this one. So this will be announced soon also, announced and scheduled as well. And as per the SWACs, so we have three certification vouchers for each of these series for the bootcamp. When we have the Ask Me Anything panel on 22nd, we will be identifying three certification voucher winners. And for those who are in the US, um, so we can ship some uh, one swag item. So the same goes for the deep dive sessions. The last session of the deep dive series, we will identify the winners and for the data cloud workshop as well. And few housekeeping items, um, as you are aware, all these sessions are recorded and they're posted to the YouTube channel and see learning camp. And all the slide decks as well, and any other important resources that are being shared during the sessions. So we're gonna link it in the description part of the videos. Make sure that you're also checking the description part. And any other upcoming sessions, so you can find all the upcoming sessions at this link. And if you are a member of this group, you will automatically get notified of any uh, sessions that are being published. And any questions after the session, as of now, we have the form open for the Ask Me Anything panel. I'll be sharing it shortly, please fill it out. And any other questions or any other communications related to this bootcamp, we, we, we will be communicating via the Slack channel and make sure that you're posting it in the Data Cloud Bootcamp channel. So, so far we have covered the solution overview, Data Cloud setup and administration, ingestion and modeling, identity resolution, which Matt covered last session. And today we are going to look at the insights. And next session will be the segmentation and then we'll follow with the activations and the act on uh, the data actions. So we have covered a major part of the topics from the exam guide. So if you're following the sessions up now, you will like almost covered like 75% of the exam topics. Today's session, it's all about the insights, which is also important, and it also uh, ha covers major part of the exam too. So last session, it was a wonderful session by Matt, uh, covering in depth on the identity resolution, and this session is going to be on in insights. And Matt, thank you very much for the great session, and uh, I'm sure we're going to learn a lot on the insights today from you. Thank you very much for coming and sharing your knowledge. Sure. Well, well, Nobody. thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Um, super happy to be here. 
So what I can do um, now is that I can, I'll, I'll share my screen. I think that's gonna stop sharing your screen and that's totally okay. All right. Can you see my screen okay, JB? Yes, we can see it, Matt. Thanks, Gilda. All right. So I'll I'll get us kicked off then today on on, on our session. So we'll kind of get we're gonna dive right in. We're gonna talk about insights. Um, but before I do, you know, this, I'm from Salesforce, and when you're Salesforce, you have to say these things. Uh, I may I might talk about a forward looking statement. I don't have any plans to, but you never know. These things just might slip out. And, and if they do, just make sure you're making purchasing decisions based off of the capabilities and features of the present. That's it. All right. Uh, and, and now it's my, my, my turn to thank everybody else that's, that's here today, that's joined us. It's super exciting to see all these people that are kind of filing in, uh, ready to, to learn about Data Cloud. Uh, I'm super excited that you're all here. Um, you know, we, we can't do what we do at Salesforce without you, without people in the community to really understand and be multipliers for us. So thanks again for being here, uh, learning what makes Data Cloud special. Um, yeah, we sincerely appreciate it. So kind of a quick uh, introduction on me. My name is Matt Wash. I work for Salesforce. Uh, I'm a newbie. I've been with Salesforce for a year and some change. Um, I was previously in the partner space. Um, I've, and, and what I do now for Salesforce is I work in partner product su success. So what that means is I'm kind of like the, 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 the interface between our product team and, and our consulting partners, kind of help them understand the capabilities and features and, and some special considerations when implementing things like, like data cloud. Um, data cloud is the platform that I support, uh, but it touches all sorts of other things as we know. And so, um, I find myself answering questions on all, all sorts of other things other than data cloud. Um, so one quick announcement I want to make is that in a, uh, if you're here on Tuesday, forgive me as I repeat myself through some of these things, uh, data cloud hands-on is now available in trailhead. And that's a super amazing thing. It has not been available to the general public until very, very recently, probably still a week, week and a half. Um, so if you you know pop up on over to Trailhead, uh, you can either take a photo with this QR code or uh, hit that, that, that link that I got there. Um, go to Trailhead, there is a new trail out there where you can ingest data, you can kind of set up a formula uh, and it kind of walks you through the whole process. So it really is a hands-on way for you to be able to, to touch Data Cloud for free. And I'm super uh, excited. And frankly, a little amazed at, at how this is being put together. Understanding what it's going to take behind the scenes to pull all of this off is really pretty impressive considering what's happening um, with, with how Data Cloud works. So I am super excited to see this happening. All right. So let's talk about the agenda today. Let's get into it. Um, we're going to recap where we've gone so far in terms of the Data Cloud story, in terms of where we're, we're moving data through the application and, and a little bit of, of why we're going to be touching on this particular stage. We're going to talk about insights. Um, and we're going to talk about um, calculated insights. We're going to cover streaming insights. In between the two, we might throw in a use case there so we understand from a customer perspective um, what's what's really interesting and you know seeing what, what, what actual customers are using calculated insights for. Um, and this is a quicker one. Um, I'll go through those, those few things and we'll wrap up with a little bit of a Q&A. Um, so that's the plan anyway. So let's kind of start with a bit of a recap on Data Cloud and where things are from like a process perspective. Um, you know, this is my favorite slide. It, it kind of shows the basic capabilities of Data Cloud, kind of how it does everything that it does. When you look at this chart and you kind of follow it from left to right, you're seeing data is flowing through the platform, starting in that source state on the left and kind of ending in how companies are actually starting to generate business value out of that unified data. You know, to kind of recap those steps real quick, we started with data ingestion. And so Elliot Harper, he, he kind of guided us through the various ways that Data Cloud can kind of connect to different data sources that's either directly uh, like like native connectors or or through its available APIs, and you can like al allow data to be pushed into it from virtually anywhere. Uh, you know the, the native connectors are incredibly powerful because with just a few 
you know, clicks of a button, you can perform a data integration. Think about that. You know, this used to be a really arduous process and, and I don't want to minimize just how amazing it is to now be able to kind of have that data from those sources so easily available. Like he, he, Elliot also kind of touched on the process of, you know, how data makes its way from its raw state, like a DSO, a data source object, into a DLO, data lake object, kind of where we apply a basic schema to it. Then uh, when that connection process is all complete, you know, all those objects from all those different data sources, they've been ingested and they're ready to harmonize. That's where Vlad picked up in the next session. Harmonization, again, is that process of taking all those different objects and records, mapping them into a uniform data model so we can see all those objects in the same way and kind of access them as though they were one combined object. So rather than looking at individuals from like a single platform, now I can kind of look at a blended list of all of my individuals in one spot across all of my connected systems. Then a couple of days ago, um, I introduced the concept of identity resolution and where data kind of takes its next step in the process. In identity resolution, we unify it. We take our various profiles that are out there, that can be individuals, that could be accounts, and we use a set of criteria and rules to figure out how we group them together, you know, in, in, into a unified profile. You know, this unified profile, this is the basis of a system of reference, you know, and it's and it's one of those things that makes data cloud special, especially how that data gets unified, especially how how we are in our special recipe recipe unifies that data. Um, but unification, though, that's not the end of the story, because, you know, although getting this single view of a customer, that's an amazing and beautiful thing. At the end of the day, that's still just a capability. You know, it, it allows you to do things, you know, that your business finds valuable. It's like any tool, right? It's like your car. A car can go, a car cannot go places by itself. Not yet anyway. Um, you know, you've got to drive it. You've got to direct it, you know, where you want it to go. And, and this is the same way. It sounds a little silly sometimes for me to equate it that way, but, you know, a single view of the customer, that's not a goal. That's just a milestone, you know? <clears throat> so, you know, now that we've reached that milestone though, that's when we can start to leverage it and, and, and you know, use that unified profile in all sorts of interesting ways. You know, and, and what we'll cover today is the process of gaining insights on that data. You know, there's a ton of ways to gain insights on data and, and I'm afraid I'm not gonna have a ton of time to get into all of those different things today. I'm just gonna be focusing on the, the biggest things that are available actually within data cloud for you to understand. And then once you have those insights, you'll be able to figure out what to do with them and how to leverage them in next week's session. So make sure you come back for that uh, as we talk about activation op opportunities and segmentation, data actions. I'll touch on data actions, but I, I think we'll go much deeper into those next week. All right, so let's talk about Let's let's get into insights now. You know, um, you know we've we've found um, as 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 individuals as companies huge amounts of value in measuring almost every th single thing that we do in our lives and our businesses. You know, Peter Drucker once said, "Once what gets measured gets managed," and boy, do we measure and manage a lot of things these days. Not just because it's fun but because there's a huge amount of business value in being able to understand data from all sorts of different angles. You know, our unified data that we have in data cloud allows us to do all sorts of activities with our data. I'm just gonna focus on a few ones today um, that data cloud could kind of handle well all by itself. Um, you know, with, with data cloud, you know, we can start to aggregate data and find useful metrics like customer lifetime value, frequency of, behavior, you know, of uh, certain behaviors, like averages, like average purchase size, and so on and so forth. We can classify our data and we can place you know, people or things in various groupings or buckets. So it's easier for us to understand and use like defining loyalty tiers or, or seller territories. You know, even things like customer satisfaction 
those can be grouped into tiers where we can determine like appropriate courses of action. Um, we can, you know, detect and we can act on important data signals, you know, when, when time matters, like being able to detect fraud or re-engagement of a customer. And we can make calculations that are based on certain points of reference. You know, maybe that's calculating the distance, you know, a customer is from a particular store or point of interest. You know, maybe that's counting the days since their last purchase or, or how long a case has been open. Now, Data Cloud and tab, if you pair it up with Tableau or Einstein Studio or CRMA, it can do a lot more with that data. You know, you can make predictions, you can start to explore that data, you can start to visualize that data, tell a, a story about it. Um, but again, you know, I've, I've got to put some boxes around, you know, the, the content that we're going to cover today and try to keep it relevant for what's available strictly within Data Cloud. Um, and also kind of try to keep it relevant for what's in the consultant exam, because I think there's a lot of you here that are interested in that. So kind of knowing what these capabilities are kind of enabled by Data Cloud, uh, that's really just important to know in general. So that's why I'm focusing on those. So let's start out with the heavy lifter of the insights team. And frankly, most of the talking today is going to be focused on calculated insights. Um, they've been a feature of Data Cloud for Gosh, I think like three years, um, which is probably almost as old as the product itself. Um, they allow you to build multi-dimensional metrics that are based on all of the data that you're ingesting into Data Cloud. You can aggregate data in all kinds of ways with calculated insights. You can run some basic mathematical functions like sums and counting, averaging, you know, to do some everyday easy stuff like building customer lifetime value. Maybe you want to build an average customer satisfaction score, RFM. So that's recency, frequency, monetary value. It's another key like retail metric. Uh, but you can also use calculated insights to kind of unleash some, some more powerful math functions within these as well. You can use trigonometry, you know, and calculate the distance between two points. You can use logarithmic functions to kind of understand the rate of change over time for a specific customer. You know, you could use standard deviation in order to sort of better understand, you know, consumption of a service, kind of spot anomalies, right? So like when you start to unleash that on your unified data, you can get some pretty powerful statistics and, and metrics that you can use in all sorts of interesting ways. Because once you've built those insights, you can make them available for other use cases. Now, once you've done that, a marketer can kind of plug these metrics into their segmentation. They can start to cart, uh, like target customers based on the statistics that are provided, you know, kind of, and that's going to help you drive better outcomes in, in advertising and email campaigns. You know, once, once you've got some handy metrics that are available, you can start to minimize prep for analysts who might need to access those metrics, you know, so they don't have to build them and prep them, reprep them every single time they analyze a single data set. Um, if you're in sales or if you're in service, you can imagine displaying those metrics in, in a service console or sales console to help your teams kind of understand their customers or their accounts better, you know, and, and, and your decision makers can kind of see larger trends in, in that unified data. You know, you can also do a lot of things with, with changing and, and changing events that are happening uh, when you start to measure things. Because I'll know, if, if, hey, if a, if a calculated insight, a particular metric hits a certain threshold or something like that, I can trigger an automated event, event and that can fire when certain conditions are met. So like if someone reaches a new loyalty tier, you know, or they're redlining on their consumption, um, I can trigger certain things to happen. There's so many cool things that can happen when you build a system that kind of runs calculations on your unified data. And, and the thing that powers it all, if you're familiar with coding language, uh, if you look at the right side here on the screen, you know, it's it's SQL. You know, that's really all it is. It's it's um Apache Spark, SQL. You know, it's a it's a process that allows you to kind of build SQL queries that build your metrics, you can then associate those with your profiles, and then you can run it on you know a manual or scheduled basis. That's it. So when you think calculated insights, just think I'm creating new attributes about my data and I'm going to do that with SQL.
So that's really how to think about it. Um, so from a process perspective, it's pretty straightforward. You know, let's work out a quick example of like how you might use a calculated insight to do something pretty simple, like build a segment based on customer lifetime value. Now, remember, Data Cloud starts by kind of unifying all your data from all sorts of different sources. So we're going to assume that getting this statistic in this scenario might not be so easy, since you might have multiple different systems out there that are tracking it. Maybe, maybe you've got multiple Salesforce works. Maybe you have more than one ERP. Or, or sometimes you have simple transaction data that's kept in a point of sale, you know? And, and maybe there's another transactional system out there as well. Maybe you've got e-commerce systems that are creating transactions. Maybe you've got B2B platforms that are doing it as well. So it doesn't always have to be, though, a complex scenario where data is scattered everywhere. And there's nothing wrong with kind of running these calculations on a single data source. But the point about data cloud is that with harmonized data, those difficult scenarios can become much more possible to tackle. Um, so with just a single metric though, you can give marketers a critical statistic that they can use to drive campaigns. And it, it really matters because this statistic could be driving them crazy right now. It might be a stat that takes them weeks to get if they have to request it through their, their BI teams. So <clears throat> as we've talked about in previous sessions, you know that process starts with having the data available by ingesting it into data cloud, we're going to harmonize it into a uniform model so we can see it, all that information in the same way. And then we unify it so we understand the customer across all those sources. And then with just a few lines of SQL, you know, we can aggregate this statistic. And from that point on, it becomes an attribute that's just close at hand anytime a marketer wants to build a segment. So we know we need SQL, right? This is a critical component of being able to build insights, you know, and to help with that, not everybody's amazing at writing SQL. Um, we've created a visual insights builder. The builder, this is gonna give you the ability to kind of organize the construction of your metrics using just, you know, a declarative drag and drop, clicks no code tool. Um, this is gonna allow you those, those insights to kind of be more easily understood as well. That's the other benefit. Um, you know, and, and more easily modified by your teams and a broader group of people, you know, so for your non-developer people out there, like business analysts, marketers, they can get a general sense of how this data is coming together, how these metrics are being made, um, and, and what needs to be done in order to, to, to make new ones or, or modify them. So, you know, Vlad is definitely going to be going through, um, the visual builder component in terms of a hands-on way. Um, I don't know if I'm going to have time to get through that today. I could certainly demo it if we do. I'd be happy to, because I actually honestly think we're going to run a little short on, or, or not run short on time. I'll be ending up early. So I can certainly dive into the platform and show you a few things if I have time for it. Um, anyway, it's it's a very smart platform. It's it's not, I mean, it's, uh, what, what can I say? Um, you still need to know how to drive it, is what I'm trying to say. Um, so you still need to know how, what you want and how you need to get there. Uh, again, you still have to drive a car, um, but you're going to be driving a fairly smart car. Uh, it's, it's pretty good in terms of being able to execute what you need it to do. So what can you have it do? Well, you can join data sources together in this builder. You can kind of run filters on that data. You can do some light transformation on it. Um, you can start to aggregate data together using all sorts of different expressions. You know, the end state being you're going to create a metric. Metric being a measurement, an aggregation of some kind, um, and a dimension. I'll come back that, to that again, uh, because you do need to remember that for the exam. You know, insights need to be usable. And they need to be relatable to other objects within the platform. So they've got to contain a metric. That's something that is you know, a, a proof of, of, of our work. We've, we've analyzed something, here's our metric, here's our finding. Um, and you need to have one dimension. And that dimension is usually something that's related to a, a profile or an account. You know, this could be an individual ID, this could be a unified ID, 
or, or this could be a, an account or a unified account. All right, I'll say it one more time. Calculated insights, they need at least one metric and one dimension. You know, metrics to measure something of value, dimensions to kind of relate it to something else. All right, so in addition to the visual builder, you can also just kind of roll up your sleeves and write up some fine looking SQL, like I know you can all do. That's ultimately what gets generated anyway, even with the builder. Um, so, and I had mentioned before this, this Apache Spark, uh, if anybody's a, a familiar with Apache Spark, um, super powerful, super fast. Um, and there might be a few functions that you might be used to in other SQL that have been pulled away. And so it's a little bit, not as full featured as other SQL, uh, but it's designed for speed and scale. All right, so let's take a quick look at the anatomy of a calculated insight. If you're familiar with SQL, it should be very straightforward. This is a, what's called a select statement. You know, we're gonna go out and we're gonna retrieve information from our various objects, entities, and fields about them. Uh, so we're gonna select some stuff and that's usually the things we wanna measure, right? And the entities that we wanna group them by. So in this example, it's pretty simple. Examples are always designed to be pretty simple. Um, we're adding together kind of grand totals from our sales order DMO. So this is a, every sale that we make is going to create a new line in that DMO. Uh, and in that DMO, data model object, we'll have orders, we'll have totals. So how much that total amount was. And so um, we're going to include that, uh, our individual as well, uh, as our dimension. That's the one thing that we're going to group it by. Uh, and then we're going to join two sources here together uh, in a join statement, okay? There we go. <clears throat> you know, we're going to find a common key here. That's our sold to customer ID. You can see that. Um, and that's equal to our individual ID on our individual record right there. Finally, we're going to determine how we want this aggregation to be grouped by defining a dimension right down here. So kind of walking this through again, we're selecting data, um, we're performing an aggregation, and so we're a, a sum here. We're gonna be adding things together. Um, this is our grand total, which is, this is our measure. When we're summarizing our grand total from our sales order, we're gonna give it a new name, new fancy name. It's total order amount. That's gonna be the metric that we're producing here. And then here, the individual, this is our dimension, we're calling it our customer ID pulling it from our sales order DMO. We're joining in individuals. We're matching our um, sales order customer ID to our individual's ID. And then we're grouping it by customers. So what we're gonna get is one row for every single individual that we have um, with a aggregation of all of the grand totals of all of their sales. So we'll get basically the customer lifetime value for this particular sales order DMO. All right, a few tech tips there on the side. Um, all of your measures and dimensions, they've got to end with an underscore underscore C. Um, you've got to use aggregate functions and measures. There's a little flexibility there. Um, we have the ability to do something called first. So um, it, it's essentially pulling the first row that comes back uh, and that gets treated as a metric. So there's a little bit of a way to sort of budget. It's that's sort of adding a little bit of, you know, um, obscurity to this at this point. Um, once you really get your hands on it, more or less, it's, it's, it's designed to be producing metrics. Um, we can just trick it sometimes with the first function in order to, or clause in order to, 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 to get a row. Um, let's see here. And there's no temporary tables, so you can't load a temporary table, but you can do other things. And I'll talk, talk about some of those things in a minute. Um, so, you know, we've, we've, we've covered one type of code-based feature within Data Cloud. Um, you know, we've seen code before, and that's when we encountered formulas. When you start out in Data Cloud, it can be sometimes a little difficult to di differentiate between take two capabilities. So I kind of just want to call that out really quick because formulas and calculated insights for you don't conflate them. Don't, don't, don't mix them up, especially in an exam because they are very different from one another. 
Um, when you're in the platform, it's going to be obvious. But from an exam standpoint, just remember, formulas calculated insights are super duper different. Calculated insights, those can kind of look at everything. They can look at all of your data, as long as it's related, as long as you have a way to kind of create connections uh, in your query statement. You can do that in, in, in batches then. And so those, those batches kind of run either on demand or on schedules. And you can run your schedules, oh, what is it now? Six, 12, and 24 hour segments, I believe. Those are your limitations. Uh, formulas, on the other hand, they can't do that. Formulas are run at the time the data is ingested into, into data cloud. And it's, and it's applied at a row level. It has no knowledge of the row above it or below it. Uh, it has, it's, it's, it's like, you know, um, all it can see is the, is the row that it's currently processing. Those are designed to function at incredibly high volumes and capacity. So, you know, we imagine injecting or sorry, ingesting like millions or billions of rows of being able to, uh, perform a, a formula function on it. Uh, it's, it's built for that type of capacity. Um, so we kind of specifically strip out anything fancy like being able to access related data or do complex things, you know, we're sacrificing, you know, um, complexity here for capacity and speed. Um, so once you've ingested that data, you know, uh, you can't reapply a formula. You get one shot, one and done. Whereas a calculated insight, you can run it and you can rerun it, you know, if, if changes are made. So as, as far as where the data is stored, the product of a calculated insight, that's going to be, a, it's going to look and feel like a new data object. It's its own thing. Uh, and it has the relationships that you kind of associate with it. Formulas, those are just going to get stored as, as fields within the DLO themselves. So clearly, like I, I put this in here just because, you know, I it doesn't feel so long since I was learning data cloud myself. And it's one of those things that can trip people up. Formulas, you know, they, they are really just designed for processing data when it's coming in uh, on individual rows. As calculated insights, they're there to run metrics. Um, the other thing is that formulas can kind of get you into a lot of trouble if you start to use it to standardize. Um, this, uh, this slide is not mine. And as soon as I was going through it to kind of prep for this presentation, I, I saw standardization in there and, you know, uh, as a supported function uh, of formulas. And I, I screamed and I removed it right away. Um, don't use formulas to standardize. You know, I had someone say like, you know, I've got lots of currencies coming in and I want to be able to use formulas to kind of standardize them into a common currency. That is very creative thinking, but also not a very great idea. Like how often do conversion rates on currencies change? And do you want data cloud to be in charge of that? You know, we're hard coding data here and you kind of changed it on its way in. And so in terms of formulas, they're cool, they're useful, they have lots of interesting things, but they are not a data standardization tool. They are just there to perform some lightweight functions on data. All right. Um, there's a lot of considerations for editing and actually, especially editing calculated insights once they're made. Seriously, there's there's a ton. Um, you know, thinking about it from a from kind of a conceptual standpoint, you've just built something. When you build a calculated insight, that thing is going to get used all across the platform. Remember, we've created a new essentially object here, and it's going to have its own relationships to things. We're going to be able to create, uh, reference it in segments and activations, and we're going to knit a bit of a sweater here in terms of connections with a calculated insight. Um, so there's going to be some limitations on what we can do with that after it's been made for sure. That's a long way of saying, don't upset the apple cart. You know, you can add metrics, you know, but uh, if there's aggregations, uh, you got to make sure that the metrics you're adding can be aggregated. Um, and then removing a metric, you know, it's, it's like removing an attribute in a platform that's got all sorts of relationships that are based on it. You can't really unknit that sweater. Uh, you know, we just don't allow you to, to do that 
in a calculated insight, you know, that's active. So what you have to kind of do when you've got calculated insights in play is, um, and you're referencing them in places, you get to back out those references. And once those back references are backed out, then you can delete the calculated insight. All right. Uh, for dimensions, there's a whole lot more restrictions, um, at least more nuances in those restrictions. Um, this kind of defines the relationship in the calculated insight to some of your data objects. So, so yeah, you, you can't remove those very easily. This That's another one that's going to be on the exam. Can't remove a dimension. I don't think you can add one either. Um, there's some rules here kind of in regarding transformations and key qualifiers. Um, none of that complexity is going to be in the exam. Um, but again, you know, we're all A students here. You know, I, I know you want to know it all. So with all the other, you know, um, assets, you can kind of access that link. Um, it's it's bookmarked, uh, or I should say you should bookmark it and then, um, you know, do whatever you like with it. Study it, you know, print it out, put it on your wall. I will not judge you for that because we all need to know our limits. And that's cool. All right. Um, let's see here. Some, some general limitations on calculated insights. Um, you get 10 dimensions per calculated insight. You get 50 measures per CI. Um, there's a lot of calculated insights that are just a single metric. And then there's some that are a, a, the whole pile full. So um, you can only have up to 50 though. Keep that in mind. Um, you can only have 300 calculated insights in one tenant. Now, when I say tenant, I actually mean one data cloud org. So that's a consideration when you're using data spaces. Um, so if, as soon as you create a, a new data space, that's kind of reducing the amount of total CIs that can happen in that, in that org. So just keep that, I believe that's a hard limit. Um, CIs can be run, and I say CI when I say calculated insights, sorry, I don't usually like to use acronyms. Um, Calculated insights can be run three times a day, um, a single one. So they, they typically, since I said they're, they're, the purpose is that they run in batch, they can be churning a lot of data here. And so there are some sort of limits in terms of how often they can be running. Um, and then the longest you can allow a calculated insight to do its beautiful thinking is two hours. And then at the end of that two hour mark, we cut it off and uh, you try to figure out what happened that caused that CI to run for two hours. All right. Um, and then as, as kind of, once you've built those calculated insights, you know, you've got a few different places you can go to kind of inspect what you made. Um, the first and easiest and closest one available to you is going to be the data explorer. Um, we've probably talked about the data explorer in other sessions. You can use it to kind of inspect your formulas that you've applied to data. Uh, kind of take a peek at, at, at other all the fields that you've ingested. Um, and you can do the same with calculated insights. Um, you can use query workspaces, which is kind of our, our, our tool that we have in, in, the, in the platform to write your own queries. Um, it's a little different. So like the, the thing that I think people are curious about when it comes to, to query workspaces is that it doesn't work exactly the same way as a calculated insight. Um, so once you start getting deep into the weeds here, you're going to find that um, query workspaces use Trino, SQL, and um, calculated insights use Spark. And so um, what you write in query workspaces may not translate perfectly uh, in, into a calculated insight. So just food for thought there um, for anyone that's really planning on getting deep into this. DBeaver. You can absolutely use dBeaver to kind of uh, connect to uh, your data cloud org. You can use the, um, there's a calculated insights API. And so you can actually pull that data using dBeaver using calculated insights API to get data that way as well. Um, it's another cool way to kind of pull data um, across orgs if you need to. Okay. So, you know, we know a little bit about what calculated insights are used for. We kind of see how they get made. We understand a little bit more now about their limitations. So it's kind of time to show off a little bit uh, how they can kind of get used. Like I had mentioned before, 
They're super easy to include when you're kind of building segments in the platform because they allow you to filter on the metrics that you defined in the insight. You know, if you have more than one dimension in your CI, you can either select a specific one or maybe group them together using further filtration logic. Um, so let me ask you, um, let's do a quick quiz here. I didn't actually write a slide for it, but I just kind of want to get um, everybody's feedback. So head over to the chat. So I've let's say let's pretend I built a calculated insight, okay? Um, customer lifetime value or whatever it might be, um, and I want to go make a segment on it, and I don't see it. I don't see that calculated insight when I'm building a segment on an individual. And what could be the reason why? There's probably more than one reason why, but what's let, let me hear some of the reasons why it might not be visible when I'm building a segment. Let's see if anybody knows this. Data doesn't exist. We need a metric and a dimension. Timothy's saying there's no dimension. Missing the individual. Yeah, you're you're right. So that's that's it. And so you got to make sure you need to go back to that calculated insight and and say, well, am I including that individual as my dimension? And so if it's not, or let's say I thought I was making a calculated insight on an individual it ended up being a unified individual. They're not, you can't use one in the other. So if I'm segmenting on unified individuals, then I can only use calculated insights that have been grouped by unified individuals. And the same thing works for individuals. So you have to make sure that those dimensions um, are connected when you start to go about your segment. Um, the other thing I think that you need to do, and this would be an important one, is you got to run that connected, that, that calculated insight. Um, you could build it. And if it's not run yet, then, then we don't have those data. We don't have that the connection yet because we can't make use of it. So it, it's got to run at least once. That's my recommendation. All right. So we talked a little bit about segmentation. In addition to being able to use it in segmentation, um, you can also use it in activation. You know, we'll go over this a little bit next week in terms of segmentation and activation being completely different steps. They, they are linked. They are absolutely sort of dependent on another, but they do different things. Basically, activation is the process of kind of building a data payload for a specific purpose. You know, and sometimes the, the data um, that, that I activate to Marketing Cloud might be different than the data I activate to, activate to something else, like maybe Google Ads. So one might need a calculated insight, maybe one wouldn't. So when we use calculated insights in activation, you know, we we actually get to include that metric as an attribute in whatever data payload we're building. You know, there's all sorts of reasons we would want to do that in terms of messaging personalization in marketing cloud. Maybe I want to set up dynamic content to look at different reward, like uh, rewards tier levels, maybe different customer lifetime values. Let me go over a quick example of, uh, uh, a, a, I will go over, I mean, uh, a customer that's going to, that, that has done that very thing. Um, but before I do that, one thing I'm particularly excited to share about in terms of calculated insights is, is there's something that's been new that's been released within the last year. Calculated insights now have the power to trigger data actions. We'll go over data actions in a little bit more depth, I said a little bit later. Um, that was previously only available to streaming insights. And this is kind of a big deal. You know, we get into this in more detail um, when we start talking about activation, but that actions, think of them as essentially as they're a trigger. That's good. They're gonna fire from the data cloud over to another system. Sometimes that's sales and service cloud in the case of platform events. Sometimes that's marketing cloud in the case of emails and journeys. Um, data actions can can reach other points. They can reach webhooks, for example. Um, so as it pertains to calculated insights, 
it means that when there is a change in a calculated insight, so it, like maybe we're looking at customer lifetime value and we're going, we're going to reach a certain threshold, or maybe we're looking at loyalty status and we've moved from like silver to gold. Um, that means the data cloud can now understand that change and it can kind of trigger a data action in another platform that could be marketing cloud, that could be sales and service cloud. There's a ton of applications for marketing, obviously, you know, you can power a journey, you can power emails that way. There's a lot of like amazing ways to kind of use that data to power sales and service cases. So imagine, you know, you've got a, let's say you're looking at device usage data. Okay. You know, and, and, you know, your, your calculated insights, cause we're, we're using standard deviation here. Maybe we're using logarithmic functions functions. We found, found some kind of anomaly. Okay. Wouldn't it be interesting to be able to reach that device's account owner and create a case on that, you know, and, and, and more than just kind of doing a, a single record activity within the CRM, you know, we can use, like, if, if we're using, um, platform events, you know, that's a pretty powerful thing because now we, we've got access to flow and we can orchestrate this whole cascading list of follow-up actions. So like, I hope we cover in some of those things when we talk about um, activation uh, next week uh, in a little bit more detail. So I, I don't want to steal anybody else's thunder there. Anyway, um, kind of continuing on the theme of use cases here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Casey's real quick. Casey's is a data cloud customer. They are a heavy user of calculated insights and segmentation. So for those of you that don't live in the American Midwest, um, I will forgive you. Casey's is a chain of convenience stores. They are super popular in rural areas. Areas There's about 2,500 stores now at this point. I think when we started this story, there was 2,000. So that just kind of gives you, we've been talking about this story for 500 stores. It's that that kind of growth is amazing. So it's anyway, what's interesting about Casey's, most people don't know, um, is that if you haven't been there, they're pretty famous for their pizza. There's so much so that if you were to like, look at the numbers of pizza retailers in the United States, they're probably one of the largest, probably fifth, maybe third. I don't know. Uh, who knew? Anyway, Casey's has really kind of embraced technology over the recent few years, and they get, got really interested in data cloud so they could start to use it to kind of help drive better segmentation and kind of personalize experiences, thinking about it to offer uh, make offers, right, for their loyal customers. Because again, they're growing very rapidly. I, th I think they got well over 10 million, they, they serve over 10 million people every single year. And there's different, there's, there's a, like at least a billion transactions that they're handling now every year. Um, and they want to add 350 stores, more stores in the next two years. So they need something that can kind of handle their high data volumes uh, and kind of help them personalize at scale. This is kind of where data cloud comes in. So not all their purchases are happening in the same place. So they're big on pizza. So some people are actually ordering, going to their website and ordering pizza there. Some people are making an order on their mobile phone. Some people are making orders in a POS system in the store. They even have kiosks at, because it's a convenience store. They also have gas there. So you could be at the pump, pumping gasoline, um, and order a pizza straight from the, the kiosk that's there. So they've got to, you know, they need a system that can kind of look at all those different data points across all those different purchases and all those different places so they can start to gain some insights on that. You know, they use calculated insights here to kind of figure out the major categories of all their convenience store items and then create dimensions and metrics for every single major category of item that they sell. You know, from there they were able to come up with a ranking then. So for each individual, you know, what, what what's their strongest affinity to each category, you know? So they know I like pizza, they've got my number. And my friend Arvind, for example, he loves sweets. Um, so with that, then they activate all those different affinity scores for each category into Marketing Cloud for every individual. Okay, so now Marketing Cloud has that information. It's got it in a data extension. Then with some additional logic, and a little magic in marketing cloud, they're able to do something very clever. Um, they didn't always have content available to promote every single category and every single item every day. 
So what they did was they basically create a, a cut score for infinities. You know, you, you'd get promoted personalized offers if it was within your infinity and the content was available to promote. And so what you end up getting then is like a, a top promotion that's based on the customer's number one affinity and then a stack of other types of promotions that are based off of lower affinities. It seems simple enough when you can kind of confine this to a single platform like web or mobile, you know, we could do that with marketing cloud personalization. Uh, but really the secret sauce in data cloud here was being able to pull all of those different insights together across every single transaction point. You know, it turns out that leveraging that unified data kind of amounted to pretty big increases for Casey's. You know, when we were following it initially, we saw some big lifts in terms of engagement. Um, but that kind of translated into some pretty big growth for the brand overall. I don't know, I don't know if anybody's been following with this, but their same store sales growth, which is a big stat for retail, grew six and a half percent over the last year. That's that's pretty pretty amazing. All right. So let's just do a quick recap now. Let's kind of talk about what we've learned. Um, there's a lot to summarize here. Um, calculated insights are basically a way to build metrics on your data. You look at your data, you aggregate things together in different ways, and then you kind of group all those aggregations by your dimensions, like an individual. There's a visual builder. You can use that to kind of build your aggregations in a more declarative way, or you could roll up your sleeves. You could write pull, pure SQL. Essentially though, at the end of the day, what gets run is SQL, you know, for folks, like, like I said, it's, it's, it's Apache Spark, um, high performance, um, machine, few trade-offs in terms of functions, um, that, than other backend environments. And it, especially the one I mentioned before, Trino SQL and, 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 and Spark, you'll might get tripped up there. So, uh, you've been warned, um, what we build the output product of a calculated insight, uh, it's essentially imagine it as its own object and it's got relationships to your individuals or unified individuals, as long as you're including them as a dimension, you know, when you create a calculated insight this way, they're going to appear as attributes that are available in segmentation and activation. You need a minimum of one metric and one dimension. And once you've built those, and especially once you start using them in your org, you're going to be limited in terms of the amount of edits that you can make to them. You know, uh, they're references that just can't be taken away very easily. So as that old carpenter's adage goes, measure twice, cut once. And I've saved my last quick quote, um, note about like calculated insights for last. Um, you can now use them with data actions, uh, which means that you can now fire events in Salesforce CRM, journeys in marketing cloud, emails as well web hooks. Um, when a, when a insight changes its, its stats about something, when there's a change data event for a particular, uh, individual or unified individual, uh, or there's new rows that are added. Um, uh, just another example here, uh, while I'm thinking about it, you know, we, there, there was, um, there's a, a client that wanted to initially build calculated insights and then kind of push all that information off to CRM right away. And they used, data actions to do it, which was the cool way to do it at the time. Now there's other things that are out there. Um, we've got copy fields, we've got related lists that are available to, to kind of do some of the same things. So anyway, um, yeah, all sorts of different ways to be able to kind of use that from a data action stat point, standpoint. All right, so we've been talking about calculated insights for almost an hour. Let's switch to streaming insights. I thought I was gonna get through this fast, uh, I guess not. Um, just like how calculated insights are kind of designed to build metrics that are based off of data that's been ingested across all sorts of different sources, streaming insights basically do the same thing, but with one very important difference. Calculated insights are powerful indeed, but they are not designed for speed. I think, I, yep, I just made a rhyme. Anyway, um, calculated insights are great, but they're not fast. You know, you're limited in terms of how often they're run. And sometimes, you know, metrics can take quite a while to process, kind of depending on how complex your, your data and, and queries are. So um, streaming insights are, however, designed for speed and they can aggregate data in very extremely small windows of time, like 60 second windows, in fact. 
you know, it comes with trade-offs, of course, in order to, to get that streaming insights. You know, you've got to have a little bit more limited view of the data that can be accessed. Uh, and we also have limitations in terms of the functions that we can use. Um, but essentially, the only streaming source that that you can really um, aggregate on is 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 the actual streaming object that that is that you're going to perform the insight on, and then any profile objects that are immediately related to it. The purpose, though, of building a streaming insight is to kind of look at that data as it's coming in really really quickly, perform some some type of quick analysis or aggregation, and then you trigger a data action based on that insight that you just gained. So now let's do a quick comparison between these two. Well, calculated insights are kind of processed in batch and they can run in intervals of six, 12 and 24 hours. I think I, did, I missed 24 hours before. Um, you can run those on a schedule if you'd like, um, or you can run them manually, you know, you know, whereas the calculations and streaming insights, those are just happening all the time. Uh, whatever your window function is set to, that's when those calculations are being run, as small as a minute. Uh, more on Windows in a second. In terms of the data that's available to each, calculated insights, they've got access to, to a much broader range of data. You know, basically any data entity that exists in Data Cloud, you can ask, access it um, with calculated insights. You know, with, if you've got the right joins in place, if you can make those joins happen. Uh, with streaming insights, again, you can really only look at that one streaming object that's coming in and, and make one hop to a, a profile. That's it. Um, so we've kind of gone over how calculated insights are used. You know, streaming insights are a little trickier. They're good for some location-based calculations, like when a device hits a certain geolocation. And here's a few more use cases um, to kind of come up with differences. We've talked a, a lot about calculated insights. I've got some of those over there. Uh, in terms of streaming insights, though, um, here's a few more examples. The first one, I hate. I'll say that. I hate this first example, fraud detection. You know, we've been saying this for a while. It's been in our, 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 our talk track for a while. While it's true, you might be able to do fraud detection in some limited capacity, like being able to kind of just calculate the sheer number of purchases that are being made. I would be very cautious about doing fraud detection and streaming insights. Just because you know the aggregation window and the scope of data, it's going to make it challenging to do this in a really reliable way. You know, it's there. You can try it. Let me know how it goes. Um, I'd love to be proven wrong about things. So feel free to prove me wrong here. There's nothing more exciting in the world than telling an engineer that something's not possible because that's when you know something's going to get done. Um, let's jump on to the next one: service and support. Um, way more reasonable. You know, we're, we're, we're using data from the web to look for anomalous behavior here. You know, we can come up, you know, we can count up the amount of time spent on a specific page maybe or a specific function um, and then kind of trigger to, you know, open a case in Service Cloud, for example, so that an agent can kind of say, hey, you know, Matt's been hitting the help document over here for quite a while on this particular topic. Maybe we need to be proactive about that. Maybe something is wrong, or at least is going to give them some insights that, hey, Matt's been digging around in the help docs already. So maybe we don't need to, you know, tell him to do that first thing when he calls for support. Okay. Um, Geofences, that's another one. That's an easy one. Um, you can do some quick trigonometry to kind of figure out how close two points are to each other. And if they're within a certain threshold, fire that event. You know, uh, the last one I have on here, because I think it's kind of funny, uh, but hey, it's plausible. You know, if you and if you write a script for a vending machine to kind of send purchase data to, to Data Cloud, I want you to do something. Contact me on LinkedIn. I will personally send you a Salesforce uh, gift card for the Salesforce store because uh, but really, you know, it, I don't expect talking vending machines to be a, a, a thing anytime soon, but um, Hey, they did it with kiosks in data clouds or with, with Casey. So you never know where things will go. The interesting thing here, the interesting nugget is that, you know, you can kind of send high volume data through a device source and, you know, using filters is definitely a way to be able to search through those different types of results and find things that are kind of relevant or, or anomalous, um, aggregate those, pass those to another system for another thing to happen. 
Okay. So streaming insights are as as far as their SQL syntax are concerned, they are very, very similar to calculated insights with fewer bells and whistles. Your aggregation functions are going to be pretty limited. What you're left with is really very simple aggregation functions like counting things and, and adding things together, counts and sums. As far as syntax is concerned, we're basically just running a select statement again with one key difference, um, and that is a window function. The window function, if you haven't seen a window function before, it basically splits the stream of data into different tiny little partitions that we can group the, the results by. So normally, when we run calculated insights, we're going to collapse our data into whatever types of groupings we're going to specify as our dimension. Remember, think it's that could be our individual, our unified individual, for example. Window functions, they give us one more degree of granularity here. So in, in addition to collapsing our data by dimension, like we do with an individual, we're going to get unique rows now for every start and end period within that specific window of time. So if I set my window as interval, my window interval as one hour, I'll see individual activities that are grouped into one hour increments. And so when I go look at my streaming insight, I'll get my insights in one hour increments for each individual. Got it? Cool. Uh, that's gonna come up on the exam. That's why I'm mentioning it. Window functions, a very unique feature to streaming insights. Um, and they have very important function, you know, the streaming insights have to have them or, or they're just, they're not going to validate. You won't hit, be able to hit the save button until you have a window function in there. All right. So let's take a look at what that data might look like as it's kind of making its way into data cloud. So along this timeline, imagine we're sort of gathering and ingesting lots of data that's coming in from a web SDK. It's sending individual events as fast as that little script can fire. Uh, and in our event stream, we're going to see six different events happening. You know, And let's say our, our streaming insight is set to aggregate data in five-minute windows by counting the number of page views by coming in that are coming in for this specific streaming source. So what we get as our aggregation for that is three data points. You know, We're going to get our window that's showing that five-minute time period as the start and end. We're going to get two dimensions in this example, though. Now we've got two dimensions. The first is our customer ID. And the other dimension now is going to be our product. And then our metric in this example is going to be the counting of those page view events. So now I can actually say, hey, how many, how many page views of product X did I get versus product Y? Okay. So when that data lands in kind of that streaming insight entity, and I go inspect that in something like the data explorer, here's what that data might look like, you know, with separate fields for each of those. So what we see in the timeline was, was one window of time that's kind of represented in, in the green rows. And then as time goes on and new windows are added, they're going to appear in that streaming insight as new rows under a new window. So this is just a reminder again, that the same stuff that you can do with streaming, uh, sorry, uh, with, with calculated insights and data actions, you can also do with streaming insights. So you can trigger platform events and CRM, fire web hooks, launch journeys, emails and marketing cloud. Now I've heard some very excited people um, hear about data actions and they can ask, they've asked me, Matt, can, can data cloud basically act as a tool to do order confirmation? Can it do stuff like card abandonment and all sorts of other little transactional things because data actions and I'm very happy to tell them that that's not a great idea. Uh, I don't actually say that that's the worst idea ever, um, but at least now, you know, now I've got your all attention. Um, and, and, it's, and it's for this reason, you know, when you have a need to take an action immediately, you know, because you have information that's coming from a system of record, you know, that, that says that you need to, you need to act immediately. Um, it might be just easier and faster and way better to figure out how to create a direct integration between the system that's kind of creating that transactional event and the system that's responsible for, for sending it. You know, so for example, if I need to send a password reset, 
don't wait around for like a data action to detect a change and fire a journey from a streaming insight to marketing cloud. Don't do that. You know, marketing cloud has a transactional API. It can handle huge amounts of capacity. Use that instead, you know, save data cloud for when you really need to do that, that aggregation function or some type of sort of enrichment or some type of filtration uh, is not a catch all thing for just firing transactional messages. All right. And this is just another slide here to kind of show you like when it comes to data actions and calculated insights, you aren't limited to kind of processing streaming data within streaming insights. You know, you can still use calculated insights to aggregate data from streaming sources. You just have your six and 12 and 24 hour batch time frame that's gonna limit how fast you can run those insights, you know? They can still both trigger data actions and they still have complete parity with each other in terms of the types of platforms they can reach. It's just to kind of give you some ideas for what you can do with those webhooks in there as well on the right side. Um, and I got some few other ideas there. Okay. So at this point in the evening, I usually get a little silly. I'm trying to keep it all together. Um, I've got, you know, some very important content to get through and, you know, what the heck, let's just have a little fun. Uh, so one really cool thing that you can do with calculated insights is actually reference them from other insights. So once your insight's been generated, generate insight A, I can retrieve insight A from another calculated insight by just referencing its API name and the, the name of the metric, almost as were they were their own table entity, which they kind of are. Uh, and you can do cool things with it. So it's kind of a great uh, way to kind of take a statistic that you might need in other metrics and then make it more accessible. There's a code example and the help talk that I've kind of linked down here at the, at the bottom of the slide, um, you know, al allows you to kind of get a sense of it. We'll, we'll also look at that example in the next page, uh, slide. So grab a photo of it if you're quick and if you really want to get it that fast. Um, what I'll show you next is kind of a quick example of metrics on metrics this is what it's called. So in this example, we've got two insights, insight A or insight one, I should say, and insight two. Uh, in insight one, the one on the left, this is basic customer lifetime value stuff. We're gonna just, or not, no, I'm sorry. No, this one is, this one is not. Let me squint my eyes here. Oh, this is, this one's email engagement. So we're gonna basically count up the number of opens uh, from a particular email engagement DLM or uh, DMO. Um, it's a useful stat just on its own, okay? Uh, but then when we have that, we can reference it from any other calculated insight. So maybe we want to take that stat and we want to start to figure out, well, how would I do some type of engagement score, right? So maybe I need to end tile this data uh, and come up with 50 different rankings and create different scores for folks. Uh, now I can actually create like a weighted, not a, like a, a weighted, but start to average out all of my customers in different end tiles based off of those open counts. That's kind of a cool stat. Uh, and so we can start to use that in all sorts of interesting ways too. Um, and we did that with a metric on a metric. So um, yeah, I love those. Uh, here's a question for you. If I reference an insight that was made the, the day before, is that an insight or a hindsight? I don't know. Anyway, we're 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 just about ready to wrap up here. So I've got a it's it's question time. It's quiz time. Um, my question here for you all, and you can just answer A, B, C, or D, is let's talk about this consultant here. They've recently modified a calculated insight, and their syntax is correct, but they're not able to save their new SQL query. What of all of these types of things is the most likely thing that's causing this issue? Is it A, that this calculated insight is currently in use by an activation? Is it B, that it's currently in a published state? Is it C, that the modifications have included a new dimension? Or is it D, that the insight doesn't include a profile dimension? They can't save it. So they've written this query and they're trying to modify it. They can't, why can't they modify it? I'm getting some C's, I'm getting some D's here. Doesn't include a profile. 
Getting a B's, C's. So C again is modifications of included a new dimension. Get a B, it's currently in a published state. All right, let's get the answer here. It's actually C. Um, it has included a new dimension and that's a no-no. You can add metrics and that's totally fine and well and good, but you can't add additional dimensions. Um, that kind of breaks the recipe. So um, I'm not sure if I, you know what? I, I'm, I think I had that. I think I had that in my list of limits there. And so if you're reading those limits very quickly, good on you. If you knew that ahead of time, even better. Um, yeah. So it was, it was, it was on the limit slide. Yeah. Thanks, Jake Nash. Uh, so that's, that's it. That's the show for today. Um, I hope you learned something. I hope you found this, this valuable. Um, what I can do now is if, if you have a question, if there's something that's kind of top of mind and you didn't get a chance to ask it yet, go ahead and fire that question in there. Um, I'm going to start scrolling back here and seeing if there's any questions that need to be answered here. So I've got a question here from Ricardo. Is there a difference between initiating a journey using a geofence from data cloud and utilizing the geofence built-in functionality in mobile studio? Oh man. Um, I think so. I'm not, I honestly, I'm not going to be the, 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 the biggest expert in terms of mobile studios, you know, um, geofence capabilities. I remember them from a long time ago, but specifically, I can't remember if those live in the app or if those live in marketing cloud. Um, and so yeah, I think they would have to live in marketing cloud. the The big difference is, you know, you can you could probably, I mean, unification is a big one. I would suppose, um, you know, you could you can access the unified individual. So that's a big that's a big difference. Um, you know, some people have more than one device. Some people might have a device that's not tied to an individual or tied to a specific email address. So, I mean, you have some advantages there. Um, off the top of my head, I mean, I think that's, and, and the ability to kind of set different windows. So, you know, geofence, I don't know if there's, a, yeah, it's a good question. I, I think I would need a little bit of time to think that one through. All right, um, let's see what else we got here. Oh, George had a good insight on when I was talking about the vending machine. Yeah, if inventory gets to a certain state, you could probably open case or task or something like that. It's a good one. I like that. Um, and you would earn yourself, if you could build it and show me that you did for a real vending machine, I'll absolutely send you that gift certificate. Um, okay, so Timothy Williams is asking about costs and we may get into costs. I'm absolutely, when it gets to architecture, architectural considerations, we can get into costs. Um, I don't know if I have off the top of my head what the costs are for, for insights. And I know everything, we, we can talk about the cost model at some point. Everything is, is, is basically running a consumption cost unless you're, you're on the old CDP licensing. Um, Data cloud licensing is 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 a totally different type of consumption model for Salesforce. You know, we're used to kind of charging based off of like seats and licenses and capabilities and things like that. And now with with data cloud, it's 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 more like a utility, right? Where when we're when you're using the system, when you've got your lights on, we're we're charging you for it. And when you think about and this, is just kind of getting me on a little bit of a tangent here in terms of calculating and understanding costs. You know, it's like asking a, a, a consumer that's about to move into a new home. What do you think your energy costs are gonna be? It's hard to know, right? It's gonna be hard to know because like, well, I don't know, geez, well, how many how many appliances do I have? And how many kids do I have if I have any? And you know, how long from my home? Do I have an electric car? And like all these little things you have to start counting up, right? In order to figure out what your, what your consumption costs are gonna be. And you could probably get somewhere close to it within the ballpark anyway of what they might be. I don't know if you're going to get super, super accurate because they might change from, from month to month. Um, and so 
costs are really tricky right now, really tricky for two reasons. It's really hard for us to be able to anticipate what your costs are going to be before you jump into data cloud. We've got some basic guidance out there in terms of, you know, how many profiles you might have and what your industry is. Based off of those industries, we kind of understand, well, this is a little bit more marketing centric one. You're going to be doing these types of things. If you're more B2B or service sales oriented, you're going to be doing more of those type of things. We have general guidance in terms of what your credit costs are going to be. But again, they're generalized and they're going to be basic t-shirt sizes for those industries of those sizes. And so it's not going to be perfect, perfect. And, and I know a lot of people want real accurate numbers when it comes to calculating costs. So, um, and, and you know, just like how you would use the energy in your home, there's different ways that you can kind of use your credits within, within data cloud. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, here's one. We're talking about insights. This is the perfect time for it. Let's say I have 50 billion people or 50 billion individuals or sorry, 50, 50 million individuals in data cloud. And I have like, and I have 50 billion engagement records. Um, but a lot of it is historical and I don't use it all the time. Do I really want to be running calculated insights, you know, free twice a day on all that data? I don't know. How, what am I using it for? So I might be producing a metric, but how useful is that metric? And what am I, what's its use case? Um, whereas like, if, if I'm just like, if I just need to access that information in like a sales console or a service console, I do not need to run a calculated insight and then just push that data over to, 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 to CRM. I can probably just create like a lightning web component access to the query API and runs me that, that one insight that I need for that one person in that one time. And so credits, absolutely. There's going to be different ways to be able to use it. And you're going to be able to come up with strategies that, that use it more efficiently. Um, there's a lot of, there, not a lot. There are some architects that kind of say, I don't think about credit costs when I build my systems. And that's just, you know, no, you can't do that. It's cost is always a factor uh, for everything. We don't live in a world of limitless things. So always think about what you're building in terms of how it's going to be able to consume. Uh, so as it pertains to your insights, I know that there's a, you can search for it. It's out there. Um, and what you're going to see is, uh, the, the consumption rate in terms of data services, credits per row process of, of calculated insights. And so that's what your, that's what your metric is. And the way calculated insights work is the same way it, like identity resolution works. If it sees a change in that underlying data, um, it's going to charge you for that row being processed. And if not, it doesn't. All right. Um, let's see here. Let's see. Oh, I have, I have a lot of questions related to, Heather says, I have a lot of questions related to how we can market to customers with multiple email addresses and utilizing CIs. Uh, yeah, I feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn if you want to ask some questions like that, or I can always direct you to like a, um, you know, an SE or anything like that, but happy to answer those questions. Um, there are things that are coming in terms of being able to, you know, reach a specific email address uh, in terms of segmentation and activation, you can activate on a specific contact point. And that's gonna give people a lot of relief being able to, to do that. A thing when we're talking about email and calculated insights though, um, oop, I stopped sharing my screen. Um, one other thing to talk about in terms of like calculated insights that's kind of cool uh, and, and kind of a marketing thing is you know, we may have the ability to kind of look at data that's coming in from lots of different consent signals. For example, let's say I've got, um, you know, um, consent data that's coming from marketing cloud. Maybe I'm getting consent data that's coming from MailChimp. Maybe I've also got Marketo in the mix. Maybe, maybe I've got Braze. There's the organizations that have these types of scenarios that have multiple, you know, marketing automation platforms. And you know, how do I be able to take in all those consent signals and, and figure out what's what? Well, calculated insights could help there. So you might be able to use calculated insights to be able to look at the, the last updated consent signal and say, hey, this one that's coming from this place is actually valid. And the rest of these that are 
older consent signals, and these could be opt-outs, these could be opt-ins, those are not valid, right? So calculated insights could really help there too. Um, that's a good one. All right, let's see. Oh, JB, I am so sorry. No, no, no problem, man. Give I wasn't sure second. if you're able to hear me or not. Can you confirm you're able to hear me? Now I can hear you. I'm sorry. My oh, okay. my, my speakers turn off. Remember I was talking about oh, consuming okay. credits and energy? My speakers turn <laughs> off when there's no sound. So sorry, I didn't hear you. No problem, man. Um, so do you have some time to answer a question on the latest release? Sure. Um, yeah. So there's a question on the integration of the data cloud with the uh, Google BigQuery. Do you have any insights on that? Which integration? Are we talking data out or data in? Maybe in. Okay. I, I don't know, but th th there's a question, but I think. And data in, okay. Um, so we're talking zero ETL, I'm assuming. Um, data in and yep. And I, I want to know this one myself. I don't know if it's going to land by March or not and forward looking statement. I'm not sure. Um, what we're expecting to see is that, um, Databricks, which is not Databricks, Snowflake, which is currently in pilot should be coming out of pilot, um, I believe in, in March. And so. I don't, I, I don't know about what, what's going on with um, Google BigQuery. I just had someone else ask me that question today. I wasn't able to talk to the PM in time to get that answer. So, um, right, if you're a, a consulting partner, um, hit me up on Slack, um, connect with me on LinkedIn. My name is Matthew Wash, happy to help you there. If you're a customer, um, let me see what I can do as well. I certainly, if you're interested in a pilot, I can certainly, get in touch with an account person and see what we can do about that. That's awesome. Thanks, Matt. Sure. It's a good question. There's, a, I mean, there's, and there's so many, so much, so many, oh, and, and so Fred, one thing you should know when we're talking about zero data or zero copy data is that there are going to be some things that you can do with zero date, zero copy data, or that you cannot do with zero copy that you can with data that's ingested. As it, as it would probably, you know, make sense, right? You know, when we have data that's coming into data cloud and we're ingesting it, we're aware of when it changes. So when a record flips from a zero to a one or something happens, we're, we're kept on top of it and we can certainly act on those changes more quickly. Um, when we use zero copy, and we're kind of, what we essentially set up is sort of a, a, a way to query that data that lives in, you know, Databricks or um, BigQuery or Snowflake whenever we need to. So I can still run a calculated insight and I'll still be running that in those increments, six hours, 12 hours, 24 or whatever. Um, and I can still detect a change that way, but we can actually, we can actually detect changes and fire data actions at the, at the DMO level. Um, and DLO level that are that, that are faster than that if we can if that data is ingested in data cloud. So this is one of all those other things to sort of consider. All right. Uh, so maybe one last question, Matt. Yeah. Uh, can you touch upon the use cases between the MCP and data cloud? Um, on the session, the deep dive. But if you can just touch upon that. Jacob is going to do a great job at that. I know. <laughs> um, and so use cases between the two. And so definitely lots of use cases one way in being able to ingest personalization data into data cloud um, and being able to, to kind of unify it uh, and be able to act on that in across platforms. Okay. Um, a couple of considerations for that though. And I, I'm one of those people that likes to be really clear on everything, uh, what, what the platform can and cannot do. So when we're specifically talking about personalization and data cloud, one of the things that comes up um, a lot is the, the idea of being able to go from unknown to known. 
certainly you can do that in, in marketing cloud personalization. I mean, in in some ways, it is sort of like a miniature CDP in itself. Um, but when we're talking about moving that data in a data cloud, you get two feeds in marketing cloud personalization. You get a profile feed, and you get an events feed, and what you're not going to get out of the box right now is um, a bridge between your anonymous and your known profiles. What will happen is you'll see an anonymous profile coming in here. I'm an anonymous profile and I've got these anonymous events that are associated with me. And then as soon as I become known, now I'm sending, hey, I'm an, an, a known person. Here's my known ID and here's all my events that are linked to my known ID. You'll never get that bridge. And so not, not out of the box. There's workarounds for it. And in the consulting community, we've talked about some workarounds to be able to build that bridge. Um, and so it's one of those things that you kind of have to think about. And in because the other thing about it is, and I'll, and I'll say this, like it's a consumption-based model. There's going to be a ton of anonymous data. And you got to ask yourself as a customer, do I really, really have a strong use case for that anonymous data in data cloud? And if there is, yeah, there's workarounds and, and, and we can find a way to support it. Um, just make sure that that's really grounded in, in, in the, a, a solid business value. Uh, in terms of being able to get data back into um, personalization, you can activate segments. And so when I build a segment, now I got personalization as an activation target. So I can just push um, activated data right back out to personalization. And so I can launch campaigns in personalization for for, for events on, on, on things that are happening with that unified data. So that's another interesting and important thing too that you can do. Uh, those are the two big ones. Um, there's other things that are happening in, in, in terms of personalization um, that are going to be really, really interesting. I think um, take a close look at data graphs um, and try to understand that capability because that's going to be a really important one uh, in order to be able to, to kind of act more real time with, with data that's getting unified in data club. Wonderful. Thanks, Matt. I think I think you covered all the questions in the chat. And we do have another session with Matt. Ask me anything panel. So yeah. I'll be sharing the form again on the Slack channel. Please be sure to fill, fill that out. Yeah, well, so thank you very much. Hope Matt. to see you there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we'll be looking forward to it. Th thanks, everyone. And we'll meet again next Tuesday, 9 p.m. Take care. Bye. Thanks, everybody.